Hello. One of the things you're going to have to do this week is you're going to have to analyze Chapter 12 of John Locke's Second Treaties of Government. So I thought it would be helpful to model what you're going to need to do for that assignment by um, doing it for Chapter 9. And this is really going to help you give a get a broader perspective of what his ideas were and um, the effect that they had on our society. So let's go ahead and begin. If, um, if man in the state of nature is as free as I have said he is, if he is an absolute lord of his own person and possessions to the greatest and subject to nobody, why will he part with his freedom? Why will he give up his lordly status and subject himself to the control of someone else's power? The answer is obvious. Though in the state of nature he has an unrestricted right to his possessions, he is far from assured that, they, that he will be able to get the use of them, because they are constantly exposed to the invasion by others. All men are kings, as much as he every man is equal, and most men are not strict observers of fairness and justice. So his hold on the property he has in this state is very unsafe, very insecure. This makes him willing to leave a state in which he is very free, but which is full of fears and continual dangers, and not unreasonably he looks for others with whom he can enter into a society for the mutual preservation of their lives, liberties, and estates, which I call by the general name property. The others may be ones who are already united in such a society, or ones who would like to be so united. Okay, so in this paragraph, let's summarize here. John Locke is basically saying here, hmm, so why would a man who I believe everyone is equal, why would he give up his freedoms? Why would he um, let someone else control him? Because to him, that just seems absurd. And he basically answers his own question, which is uh, being that free is unsafe and it's not very secure. So there, and there, the loss of the property can be terrifying. So they give up their rights in order to have that safety. Okay, so let's go on to 124. So the great and chief purpose of men's uniting into commonwealths and putting themselves under government is the preservation of their property. See, I said that. <laughs> the state of nature lacks many things that are needed for this. I shall, I shall discuss three of them. First, the state of nature lacks an established, settled, known law received and accepted by common con consent as the standard of right and wrong and as the common measure to decide all controversies. What about the law of nature? Well, it is plain and intelligible to all reasonable creatures, but men are biased by self-interest as well as ignorant about the law because they don't study it, and they aren't apt to accept it as a law that will bind them as if it is applied to their particular cases. Okay, so the first um, the first reason he says that men give up their rights because nature isn't fair. There's no set laws. There's set laws in our our society, but nature there's no right or wrong. You know, there's no um, established laws that everyone in the in nature has to follow, and that can be scary. Okay. Section 125. Secondly, the state of nature lacks a known and impartial judge with authority to settle all differences according to the established law. In that state, everyone is both judge and enforcer of the law of nature, and few men play either role well. Men are partial to themselves so that they, that passion and revenge are very apt to carry them too far and with too much heat in their own cases and their own negligence and lack of concern will make them remiss in other men's cases. So, 
he's saying here, all right, men want to judge. That's not going to be partial. And in nature, you're, uh, you have to be the judge and the enforcer. And a lot of people don't like to play that role. So that's one re another reason why they give up their rights to their society. All right, section 126. Thirdly, the state of nature often lacks a power to back up and support a correct sentence and to enforce it properly. People who have committed crimes will usually, if they can, resort to force to retain the benefits of their crime. This includes using force to resist punishment, and such resistance often makes pun the punishment dangerous, even destructive, to those who inflict it. So, a lot of people are good, but if they're trying to enforce rules, oftentimes if somebody's breaking that rule, those rules, they'll come back violently, and that can be quite scary, and that can, that can be quite intimidating. All right, so let's continue. 127. Thus, mankind are in poor shape while they remain in the state of nature, despite all their pillages there, so that they are quickly driven into society. That is why we seldom find any number of men living together for long in the state. The drawbacks it exposes them to make them refuge under the established laws of government and seek there to preserve their property. This is what makes each one of them so willingly give up his power of punishing, a power that to be, that to be exercised only by whoever is appointed to that role. This being done by whatever rules are agreed on by the community or by those whom have authorized to draw up the rules for them. This is the basic cause as well as the basic justification for the legislative and executive powers within a government as well as for governments and society themselves. Okay, so Mankind is in poor shape when they stay in as a society, and that is what makes them so willing to give up that power because somebody else is taking care of it. All right, let's read this last few paragraphs here. For in the state of nature, a man has, along with his liberty, to enjoy innocent delights, two powers: the first to do whatever he thinks fit for the preservation of himself and of others, so far as the law of nature permits. This law makes him and all the rest of mankind into one community, one society distinct from all other creatures. And if it weren't for the corruption and viciousness of degenerate men, there would be no need for any other law, no need for men to separate from this great natural community and by positive agreements combine into separate smaller associations. The other power a man has in the state of nature is the power to punish crimes committed against the law of nature. He gives up both of these powers when he joins a particular pol politic society, a private one so to speak, and brings himself into a, any commonwealth separate from the rest of mankind. So this is nice because here he kind of gives those positive aspects to why it would be better not to be part of the, the society. That man gets to have, um, to, he gets to live his life the way he thinks is fit. And um, if it were in, 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 if it were for the corruption of government, then there would be very few, or, 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 or the corruption of men who try to take advantage of others, there would be no need for any of those other laws. So, um, but um, he gives up those powers to, to be more comfortable. All right. So, he rounds it out and says, he gives up both of these powers when he joins a particular politic society. So here in these next two paragraphs, he's going to talk about those powers he gives up. The first power, he gives up to be regulated by laws made by the society so far as is required for the preservation of himself and the rest of society. Such laws greatly restrict the liberty he had under the nature, law of nature. 
Secondly, he wholly gives up the power of punishing the natural force that he could use for punishment in the state of nature he now puts at the disposal of executive power of the society. Now, that is his new state in which he will enjoy many advantages from the labor, assistance, and society of others in the same community, as well as the protection from the strength of the community as a whole. He must also give up something, for he will have to part with much of his natural freedom to provide for himself as is required for the welfare, prosperity, and safety of the society, as well as being necessary that is, this is fair because the other members of the society are doing the same thing. So, the first power he's giving up is making up those laws. Uh, he, gives, he gives up to be regulated by laws made by the society. So, by as far as that required the preservation of himself and the rest of society. So, what does that mean? The laws of society are much greater than the ones he had under the law of nature. Then he is giving up that power of punishing, and then he's going to be giving up that power to provide for himself. In a structured society, man has to provide for everyone else. And it's usually fair, because as long as everybody's doing their part, then you have a functioning society. Okay, so let's move on here. But though men who enter into society give up the equality, liberty, and executive power they had in the state of nature, each of them does this only with the intention of better preserving himself, his liberty, and property, for no rational creature can be thought to change his condition intending to make it worse. So the power of society or legislator that they create can never be supposed to extend further than the common good. It is obliged to secure everyone's property by providing against the three defects mentioned above in sections 124 through 26. The ones that made the state of nature so unsafe and uneasy. Whoever has the legislative or supreme power in any commonwealth, therefore, is bound to, to govern by establishing by established standing laws and promulgated the uh, the and known to the people and not and not by on the spot decrees with unbiased and upright judges appointed to apply those laws in deciding controversies and two to employ the force of the community at home and only in the enforcement of such laws or abroad to prevent or correct foreign injuries and secure the community at from attack. And all this is to be directed to the peace, safety, and public of the good of the people, and nothing else. Okay. So, let's think about what we have read in Chapter 9. What is John Locke's argument here? He is saying that, <laughs> he is arguing that the main reason why people like to be Govern is because they want to protect their property and they want to make sure and they don't want to have the responsibilities of being <laughs> the judge and the enforcer of those things. And what his makes his arguments effective is that he provides reasons for his um, answer here where he says, you know, um, he um, provides that nature lacks the established, settle, uh, settled and known law, and it lacks an impartial judge. Then he further uh, backs up his argument by um, talking about the powers that man is willing to lose, and while it's enjoyable, enjoyable to um, have that liberty from society, man finds comfort in um, those regulated laws. And he provides very effective evidence there. Um, and if we think about the way he presents his argument, he first says, he gives the answer, like, why would anybody uh, want to give up their power? And then he um, states, uh, then he gives his three reasons, and then um, he um, 
We're going to have to wrap up in the next video because I'm about to run out of time. Bear with me here.